Good afternoon also from my side. Um, I have the pleasure to present you a brand new WWF study, uh, which was released actually last week. Um, this study is about an, a first assessment we did on the, on the Alpine Arc concerning the status of the freshwater system. So what are we actually talking about? What's the scope here? Um, we're talking about the Alpine Arc. It's home of 14 million people, but um, about 180 million people are using Alpine water. Um, we have a unique biodiversity here. Uh, that means we have about 30,000 animal species, 13,000 plant species, many endemic species uh, within those. Uh, it's one of the one of the hotspots, one of the biodiversity hotspots uh, in Europe. But not everything looks good. Uh, we know, we knew before we did the study that the Alpine freshwater system is threatened by various. Uh, uh, um, by various uses, land use, wrong land use, uh, tourism, ex exploitive tourism, energy production, uh, technical flood protection measures, uh, are just some few, to, na to name some few, uh, which are over decades already uh, threatening the Alpine freshwater system. So what are we doing actually? Or what, why did we think, okay, it's time uh, to make a study, to make uh, an overview about the, the Alpine system. Basically, there was a, a, a lack of an overview. So there was, uh, uh, in, the, in the 90s, uh, there were a, a study from the Alpine Convention um, on, on basic data, I would say, concerning the Alpine uh, freshwater system. But now we have new tools uh, with the Water Framework Directive coming in. We, we had new tools and, uh, and, and, and Pan-Alpine overview about uh, the status and threats on the Alpine river system uh, wasn't existing. So um, we wanted to produce a, a, a comprehensive Pan-Alpine overview um, foundation, a basis basically uh, for setting protection and restoration priorities. So to know which rivers are uh, or need to be protected, which rivers need to be restored. Uh, doing that, uh, we identified three main causes. I think um, one most important one uh, for WWF is uh, the designation of uh, very high protection priorities. This is a generic term I will explain later but basically no-go areas. We wanted to see where are no-go areas in the Alps. Um, sorry. Uh, within those also, uh, we wanted to see, okay, where are, the, where are the, the, the river stretches that have a high restoration potential? <coughs> the second step, uh, we wanted to identify and document uh, where are the main pressures, what are the main pressures, what are the main impacts uh, on the Alpine freshwater system and to develop that study further we needed to uh, develop also a, a, a consistent and comprehensive database. So it, we, we are able to uh, uh, conduct further studies as we saw yesterday the Water Framework Directive uh, river basin management plans are working in cycles so to be able to update the, the data we actually get it it is very important to, to produce a database. So let's dive right in to the results. Uh, I heard yesterday uh, visuals are better than, than words, so you will just see pictures. <laughs> uh, this is the Alpine freshwater system. Uh, the borders are the, the borders of the Alpine Convention. Uh, we have about uh, 57,000 uh, kilometers of, of Alpine rivers. Uh, the bulk, I would say, about one-third uh, is found in Austria, uh, followed by Italy and France. Uh, there are about, if, to get an idea, it's about uh, 8,000 kilometers of large rivers. Uh, that's, that's important to remember for, for later. Um, so 8,000 kilometers of large rivers with a bigger basin than 1,000 square kilometers. 
This is, uh, we conducted a study with, uh, or we, we will, um, produced to have the protection priority. Let's stay, uh, let's start like that. Uh, the protection priority I, I mentioned before is based basically on three criteria. This is one of them, the ecological status uh, according, to the, according to the Water Framework Directive. Uh, so you see this is an, an, an overlay, basically all of official data uh, we get it in, in all the Alpine countries. Uh, for Switzerland we used a different method because uh, obviously Switzerland doesn't collect Water Framework Directive data. Uh, but uh, the University of, of Life Sciences in Vienna uh, developed a surrogate method uh, based basically on, on uh, biological data uh, to be able to compare uh, the, the, the ecological status of the Water Framework Directive with the data that was available in Switzerland. So what we will see here, uh, just as a, as a bullet point, I would say, um, you see that the, the main, uh, or that we don't have left many uh, rivers that are in a high, very high ecological status, in a high ecological status. <coughs> and the bulk of those are found actually in the headwaters. This doesn't maybe not come as a surprise, uh, but nevertheless, it's good to remember. So small rivers basically are the ones who are looking better than the large ones. If we could get the large ones, we have about 340 kilometers left of a high ecological status from a river system of 8,000. So that's not much. Um, the good news, let's call it, is that uh, we still have uh, quite some rivers in a good ecological status. That means, according to the Water Framework Directive, this is where we want to go with the rivers worse than the good ecological status. So there is still a lot of work to do, I think. Nevertheless, uh, I think um, it can be done till 2027. 20, uh, uh, and and uh, the, the study showed that there are um, still some quite big part left in a, in a good ecological status. Um, but, again, uh, these are mainly found on small rivers again. Going further, the second important criteria we applied <coughs> was uh, floodplains and wetlands. Uh, obvious, obviously, they're, they're not as, as prevalent uh, as the ecological status. So we cannot find them in a, in a, in a, in, in, on every river. Um, but nevertheless, we were a bit surprised on the reduction, actually, uh, of floodplains and wetlands we found. You can see here we have two categories, category A and B. Um, category A, we just applied to Austria, Switzerland and Germany, where we have an inventory, ba basically, on floodplains. Category B is the, the rest, so to say. Um, and looking uh, on the map, you really have to look for them, basically. So the message to take away here uh, is there is not much left. We have about 8% of the Alpine River system uh, still contains floodplains and wetland category A uh, or B, which is not much. Uh, it was not possible, really, to uh, set it in, in opposition to what was, uh, what was there 100 years ago, because data is just missing. Uh, but with talks with, with, with experts from the countries, uh, our own experiences, we know that floodplains, wetlands are one of the most endangered habitats actually in the, in the Alpine River system. So they are disappearing still, and there is just very, very little left. The third criteria we applied for the protection priority uh, was protected areas, quite obvious, I would say. Uh, but we made a distinction. Uh, you might say, okay, it looks like everything is protected here. It's nearly everything is green. It's about 30%. Um, you might be right, but uh, it depends on what protection we're speaking about. 
we made a, a distinction between uh, protected areas that offer real protection and protected areas that are um, on the national level um, the international recognition of those of those protected areas is uh, to say it's not easily explained it's national protected areas uh, follow a different rule than, than uh, international protected areas so the dark green ones are basically the ones we are very much interested in because those are IUCN 1 and 2. So going from the, from the strict nature reserve, wilderness areas and national parks. And those are not a lot. <laughs> uh, we are talking about really, really little uh, part of the, of, the, of the whole Alpine river system. Again, if you look at the large rivers, you see the magnitude, there is nothing basically. On large rivers you can, you can try to find some, uh, you, w you won't be able to. It's about, uh, I think, under 100 kilometers basically left. So there is, there is, it's basically nothing. Okay, so with those three criteria, uh, we tried to set up a, a protection priority sc scheme. Um, <clears throat> going from a very high protection priority, uh, meaning, as I explained before, these are our definite no-go areas, down to a low protection priority. Um, a high protection priority are river stretches also that uh, are not go areas, as you might think. Uh, they have to kept free of development. These are good ecological status, uh, these are Natura 2000 areas, these are other protected areas basically. Uh, category B flood plains, included in those high, protected, uh, high pr uh, protection priority um, river stretches. The very high ones are uh, high ecological status, uh, protected areas after the IUCN 1 and 2, and uh, flood plains uh, category A. So what happens? when we lay that over a map. We see that uh, we have about, sorry, uh, <clears throat> we see that we have about 15% of rivers that are in a very high protection priority over the, the whole Alpine arc. That means those rivers are the ones we really need to focus on protection. Uh, the problem is that uh, and I will explain that, or I, I will summarize that later. Protection doesn't mean protection, as I said before. Uh, various protected areas in those green river stretches, uh, there is still development on hydropower, for example. So this is not an, a per se exclusion. So this is, if you will, our, our outcome, our uh, basic map on how the Alpine river system looks like with a combination of three biological, ecological criteria. In a second step, as I said before, we wanted to know also, okay, good, we know now which rivers are very, very important for protection, but which are the rivers that, that need to be restored on a priority basis system? Uh, so we also looked into that <coughs> and uh, what we found out is that there are quite a lot. <laughs> there are quite a lot of rivers uh, that, that are not meeting the criteria after the Water Framework Directive. So the basic criteria we set here was uh, a restoration need for natural water bodies. That means they have an ecological status with uh, three or less. So this is where we want to go till 2027 to have a good ecological status, or um, if we are thinking about uh, heavily modified uh, water bodies, we are, uh, want to achieve a good ecological potential. So we see here uh, all these colored river stretches are in need of restoration, which is a, a very, very big task, I think. Uh, it has to be achieved till, till the end of the cycle of the river basin management plans. I just want to show you also another, another map which will demonstrate two things. 
One is quite obvious, there are a lot of hydropower plants in the Alps. Um, you might think, okay, and here? This looks free, this is like, there is a lot of space here too. True, uh, it does look like that. <laughs> but uh, there we come to one of the biggest problems we have in the Alpine Arc, and that is data. Uh, so that we are, there is no database on which hydropower plants are actually existing in the Alpine Arc, which new hydropower plants will be built in the Alpine Arc. So this is something, if you work with official data, you find that gaps, which is, I think, an, an important part in the discussion we, we are engaging at. Data insufficiency is one of the biggest problems we are dealing with in the Alpine Arc. So let me summarize that very shortly. Um, data availability uh, is one of the issues. Uh, either it's missing or it's not obtainable. Uh, I think we heard those points over the last yesterday quite a lot. Data collection and allocation is not transparent and there is no harmonization between the member states. Uh, Alpine rivers are threatened. Uh, as you can, as you saw, there are many hydropower plants already existing in the Alpine Arc, especially large rivers. As I said before, we were speaking about the 340 kilometers in a high ecological status. This is not a lot. They are really heavily degraded. Uh, especially hydropower plants, new ones, small ones, are threatening headwaters in the Alpine Arc. So these small ones are building normally in the, in the, in the, in the headwaters of, of, of the freshwater system. So this is something uh, that has to be avoided. Uh, suffer already from existing pressures, I just wanted to uh, give you an example. Uh, we heard different numbers yesterday. Uh, I can give you these numbers. 50,000 barriers in, in Austria. So that means you go and you don't find one kilometer free, basically. Uh, we have over 3,000 hydropower plants and uh, while we were conducting the study with that numbers, I think already 50 new ones were built in that time frame. It's still coming a lot, uh, there's still on a lot on the list to be built in the next years. Uh, as I said, face many new threats, new hydropower plants, but also climate change. Uh, climate change is something that is very much connected with how the Alpine freshwater system works. Degraded rivers don't have the resilience they need to counter the effects of climate change in the Alps. Speaking about floods as a prevalent example. Uh, and they lack sufficient protection. Uh, as I already said, um, it's very important to save what we have, healthy rivers, in a, in a good high ecological uh, status with uh, floodplains uh, and to enforce, uh, so to say, uh, existing legislation. Um, protection status of rivers is often weak and uh, it doesn't prevent them degradation per se. Last slide. Uh, so what, what is our lesson from that? I tried to summarize that in four bullet points. Uh, what we really need is an improvement of data quality and quantity. Without that, we are not able to see the real picture, to see the real picture, how do our rivers, under what pressures our rivers are, uh, uh, are found on our rivers, basically. So this is something that has to be really on top of the agenda, improve data quality, improve data quantity, harmonization between member states so that we can really use it uh, for a pan-alpine overview. Definition of no-go areas. This is something we really, really need as a strategic planning tool in the river basin management plan. I think there is no alternative for that. Of course, the whole conference is about that. What else do we need? We read uh, to restore degraded rivers, floodplains, wetlands, large rivers, as I already said, are disappearing slowly over the years. Uh, one of the most threatened ecosystems. This is where we should focus our restoration attempts. And uh, last but definitely not least, to combine all those factors, 
we need to engage in a Pan-Alpine River management, large-scale management, so we can combine our efforts to restore and protect, basically, uh, healthy river systems, restore degraded river systems, and be sure to balance these nature protection schemes, nature protection thoughts, with uh, basic human needs. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I don't know, uh, maybe some of you <coughs> also participated in the morning session where I gave a framework what WWF in this region think about wetland restoration in general, what is our approach, and what we think are the necessary steps in order to have more sections, rivers restored. This afternoon, together with Uli, we would like to follow uh, this process, what uh, Christoph started, and we would like to shortly present another uh, restoration potential assessment, which was done for the Danube and some main tributaries of the Danube, which is just also an initial tool to reach our final, final goal, to have more rivers restored. And uh, I will give a framework around it, and just to entertain you, <laughs> Uli will <laughs> present the study itself. The existing knowledge, I would say, we have a lot of plans exist. We have the river basin management plans. We have a lot of other type of plans, but they are rather focusing on, for example, flood retention polders, flood emergency reservoirs, or other type of master plans. We have also really nice and a lot of type of separated, scarce restoration projects with all the experiences around it. So this is a kind of basis. But <clears throat> what we see that, for example, just following this river basin management planning issue, what we see from the country perspective, and now I'm talking about really the national level, not local level, it's just, sorry that I say that I think it's mission impossible. And really countries cannot move forward with the restorations, only with some restorations, but not that great improvement, what is expected by the Water Framework Directive or what we expect. So we need to find why, why this is not happening, to be honest, or very slow. The, the existing approach is that still there are a lot of studies only focusing on the technical feasibility and do not deal with the socioeconomic aspects, the land ownership situation, the land owners, the land users will. There are a lot of feasibility studies in the drawer because when they went after the feasibility study, they didn't go to talk with the stakeholders there or because the stakeholders were not involved in time, then just the whole initiative failed. We have very good, nice restorations in the countries, but these are still small-scale restorations. This is what I also mentioned in the morning. 50 hectares, 100 hectares. And this is very uh, hard to implement even 100 hectare restoration. But if we compare with the potential which is along the Danube and tributaries, it's still very small. <clears throat> Open our mind and be there to think not only between the flood protection dikes, so on the active floodplain, but also on the former floodplain outside the dikes. Give yeah, more space to the river concept, which is a very big challenge. 
So what I would like to focus a bit, larger scale restoration, which can be outside the dikes, which can be even on the active floodplain, depending on which country we are talking about. I would like to present you now just a very simplified scheme. This is the backbone, what we are going to talk about. What we think and we suggest to the countries and we try to help to the countries, list first the potential avoidable floodplains, former ones, active, everything. Define them. Then, based on different type of criteria, we need to focus. We cannot restore everything. We, within 30 years, we cannot restore everything. That's why I said I think it's mission impossible. But, based on different type of criteria that Uli will detail a bit, we can focus, choose one, two, three in the next years, and do that, learn first how we should do that. We cannot do large scale restorations or bigger restorations if the proper legal and financial background is not there. For example, WWF in Romania is driving a project to find out what are the main obstacles of large-scale restorations in Romania in terms of the legal background, in terms of the financial background? And financial background doesn't mean only, okay, what kind of donors I can contact. But what I mentioned also in the morning, if we want to change land use, because there are a lot of borders or other areas where there are agriculture, intensive agricultural land use, how I can convince or negotiate with the farmer to change his practice and instead of intensive land use, choose an extensive one, change to grazing or anything else which is more nature friendly, if still he gets the subsidy from the agriculture, I mean the agricultural subsidy, for growing crops, doesn't matter if this is not profitable because the flood or the drought will kill the crops, but he gets it. Then it's hard to convince or negotiate. Then, of course, just implement the chosen one, two areas and monitor if what we wanted at the beginning, we really reached those results. So I would say this is the backbone, a very simplified one, of course. And uh, with Uli, we would like to detail some parts of this. Stakeholder involvement. I would say it's an overarching and overlapping issue. I will detail a bit later on after Uli. So Uli, the floor is yours. <coughs> Yeah, thank you, Loris. Um, yeah, well, at the beginning, uh, maybe I just uh, have to say that this is a very, very long story, and WWF International uh, was one of the first international um, organizations dealing with uh, floodplain restoration on a, on a large-scale approach, also for the Danube River Basin, a long time before uh, governments uh, or other organizations deal with that topic. Um, I will talk about these technical possibilities, about a very raw initial um, possibility to classify floodplains and to get out somehow a prioritization for restoration. It is a very complicated task and much more complicated than if you like to prioritize uh, dams, to make dams possibility for fish. It's much easier. And for floodplains, so we want to I want to start with lists and inventories of floodplains. Yeah. There is still um, a high need to improve our database about floodplains. Um, simply, basically spoken, we talk about the so-called morphological floodplain, former floodplain, and active floodplain. Maybe only at this point, the active floodplain is what we can find 
uh, within the dikes, uh, um, which are protecting the land behind uh, for 100 years flood event, basically in Europe. There is some freeboard, so it's a bit more than 100 uh, years, but in some areas it is also less. Um, the former floodplain can be defined by various, uh, <laughs> so we spent 10 to 15 years for the Danube Basin. We talk about 800,000 square kilometers, and the Danube had a discharge of 6,500 cubic meter at its mouth in the Danube Delta, which makes the Danube as a 20th largest river, a river globally by discharge, not by catchment like in Australia, or, but uh, by discharge. So we have a lot of water and we had uh, huge, huge floodplains, which are now uh, strongly limited to some 20 persons of their original size. Um, so um, there are the definitions how to define these floodplain areas. And I put here on the corner one example from Austria. This is uh, actually also published uh, Austrian floodplain inventory, uh, which is based on a floodplain object base. So here in this case, we find about 820 floodplain objects in Austria, which are smaller, bigger, which are under, under better conditions, ecological conditions or hydrological conditions. <laughs> Um, or under worse conditions. So therefore it is a very good uh, um, uh, addition also to your approach uh, for Austria. Uh, it will be very interesting and out of this uh, number of floodplains still existing in Austria, only a very few still um, uh, host uh, or provides uh, really natural, near natural conditions. So that's the very first step to get a better knowledge understanding of uh, floodplain as, a, as one of the most significant and important habitats, or even it's our living room as, as man, as people. It's, it's for human beings, the valleys are absolutely crucial. What I want to show you here is a very, very simple approach to subdivide floodplains into... Um, yeah, you can, you can read it in the legion. Um, we have, um, or even we have a pointer here. Um, at the beginning, you have uh, near natural floodplains. Uh, in the second uh, point, you have floodplains which are strongly altered by accretion of fine sediments, uh, mostly even disconnected by rivers. <laughs> we have backwater floodplains. Yeah, they are here in Austria in particular, where you have dams and you have disconnected floodplains, but they still exist, yeah? or some tributaries come in. We have technical flood polders, yeah? which are really uh, able to, to, to cut down flood peaks, but it works only if you have a very precise hydrometeorological forecast and flood forecast. And finally, of course, we have those floodplains which are outside of the dikes, of the flood dikes. Sometimes they still uh, have a lot of oxbows, forests, wetlands, uh, not wetlands, grasslands, meaning you can find former remnants of floodplains. But you have also as well huge agricultural areas, of course, or even urban uh, settled areas. So, the delineation of so-called potential sites, which we could theoretically restore, uh, must cover this whole area of morphological floodplain, so everything what was flooded originally. And the process of deline delineation, of course, is already a very complex one. You can go iterative from upstream to downstream. You have really analyzed the whole Flood, uh, the cover of floodplains, of previous floodplains, by exclusion of settlements and infrastructure, of course. It is very important if you choose those sites outside uh, to uh, recognize size, shape, and position. So you cannot simply take some oxbow uh, somewhere outside, very far from the river. So you must choose areas which are close to the dikes, or which are in front of settlements yeah, um, for flood protection. And you will see this in the methodology further on. So this is a very inter interactive process, uh, uh, process 
but again, it still have to cover the whole morphological floodplain from upstream to downstream from the headwaters to the mouth of the rivers. Regarding a prioritization or first assessment, assessment of um, floodplain of potential restoration areas in this former floodplain. Yeah, and I'm talking now only about this, not about restoration in the, in the active floodplain, which is also obviously a very important task. But I just talk about this enlargement of floodplains. So you can see they are different uh, or four parameter groups here. Uh, why hydromorphology is important. Yeah? So we have uh, um, high classes with, uh, with still uh, valuable good conditions and we have worse classes uh, in particular uh, um, along dams and impoundments. So meaning where I still have free-flowing river sections, uh, su su uh, success of restoration uh, should be set higher. This is already, let's say, a political, somehow a political or technical estimation. Second, the size classes. We talk about sizes, and we will, you will see it on the next slides. They are categories, and if you look like this, 1,000 hectare, 1,500, larger than 5,000 hectare, this is actually in Europe, in Central Europe, uh, nearly mission impossible, yeah? You are right. The largest, in, in, in Europe, the largest uh, areas, I think in the Netherlands, on the Rhine River with 2,000 hectares, we just have a reconnection of floodplains on the Elbe River in Germany with 800 hectares. So you can see even this lower classes um, is, is very hot, very hot. But of course, we talk about the Danube, and we talk also about a larger river, much larger river. And we talk about floodplains, which were disconnected just 25 years ago, even 30 years ago, under Ceausescu in Romania, for instance. All of the areas along the lower Danube were disconnected even in the 80s of last century. Uh, meaning if there's not strong incision of channel, um, there is still a lot of wetlands remains and remnants remains in this form of floodplains, not everywhere, but some in some areas. And therefore, these large areas, and here we talk about 30,000 hectares of those huge areas disconnected in the 80s. Yeah? So there is a huge restoration potential. And of course, protection status is another parameter group. Uh, again, coming back to the Austrian floodplain inventory, there is an overlay of more than 50% of uh, floodplains already protected, somehow protected, so you see also areas which are already, which, which have uh, a high um, protection status, we estimate that it is much easier to implement restoration. It is again, uh, um, let's say, not our assumption, but uh, we think that uh, it makes sense to, 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 bar, uh, to, to concentrate and focus on those areas. Finally, land use. Of course, it is possible to do restoration in, uh, in agricultural areas. If we talk about grasslands, I would even say restoration, large-scale restoration is, is very good and possible. But in those areas where we have really pure infrastructure, uh, uh, agricultural uh, usage, of course, this restoration um, uh, um, uh, is, is more, more and more difficult. Um, so, one result of the study, which is already from 10, uh, to, uh, to 20, 2010, uh, was an overview of the Danube Basin. So, we are in Vienna, we are here. And so, you can see how important this lower Danube is regarding this potential. Even if you look um, at, the, at the light green, at this time, even for Romania, a lot of areas were proposed over 500,000 hectares. Now they reject uh, this initial proposal. It was a kind of misinterpretation uh, or it was a very first raw overview. And nowadays they have about 20% um, of this green uh, squares you can see here 
uh, still have to be green today. Yeah? So in the newest river, ma uh, river basin management plan, about 15% of all this restoration potential areas are designated physically, which is still the highest value across Europe. So Romania proposes, uh, proposed about uh, 90,000 hectares of floodplains for restoration, which is uh, unique. Uh, for Europe. There's no other country proposed so much, even if they reduced here this number. Yeah? So you can see there, there are many, many projects already implemented regarding to floodplains here in, in Bavaria, and in, but in particular in Austria. But most of these projects are dealing with river restoration, widening of channels, uh, which is all, uh, uh, in particular, um, uh, a very good background for floodplains, but not in all cases. And if we talk about the enlargement of floodplains, we have in, in, in Austria uh, maybe some seven, 800 hectares over the past 10 years. So it's not a lot. Huh? So um, if, you, if we talk now about this, uh, um, this potential, so you can see that um, in total, uh, in this study, we propose 800, uh, 810,000 hectares. And if you look here uh, for Upper Danube, 50,000 hectares. But on Lower Danube, you can find 500,000 hectares. And this is what Romania still proposes, some 90,000 hectares. If you uh, look this for, for mean area size, this would mean those areas which we propose are for German and Austrian Danube in a, in a, a magnitude of 1,200 hectares. For Middle Danube, they are even, they're becoming much larger. In the Lower Danube, these are the largest ones. Um, again, this approaches. Um, we develop further these approaches also of prioritization. And this is, I would say, the, the latest um, proposal for a river corridor of, uh, oh, sorry, of, of, uh, of Drava River, Amura River, and Danube River. So altogether, these are um, uh, uh, five, five, over 500 kilometers of rivers. It's also a large scale, 900,000 hectares is the overall project area here. And what you can see is that this proposal contains um, restoration potential, uh, restoration proposals for channel banks, uh, reconnection of side channels, uh, and floodplain restoration. Yeah? So in different colors, meaning the darkest, uh, the darkest Pink uh, areas has, have the, the highest um, restoration potential. And already this map or analysis reaches a level of resolution that you can really go into, in, into planning. Yeah? And of course, this is a work, uh, <laughs> I would say, maybe in 30 years. We can come, come back to this and, ca and can watch on it which area we really managed even if we propose one area as a flat polder, meaning a more technical flat polder, um, but in particular, of course, which areas which we, we will see, which we are able to, to restore. And even on Drava, we had also some serious floods over the last years. So um, we have this, uh, and of course, flood, uh, as parameter is important for retention capacity, so we calculate the capacity, and therefore this uh, data is very valuable. Coming to the last two slides, uh, regarding the further prioritization, um, it is important always, yeah, we have for floodplains, we have a lot of ecosystem services, um, but of course, as WWF is also focusing on biodiversity and conservation goals, it is important also to, to use as much as possible ecological data for further assessments. The land ownership is a very Im, Im, uh, significant topic. And also for compensation of damages from agriculture, it is really not easy. 
after the accession of Romania or Bulgaria, uh, everybody talked, ah, they have so huge, uh, extensive uh, agriculture, it is easy to, to save areas, to take out areas from intensive usage. Yeah? But just five years, 10 years ago, uh, you, can, you can sell them per hectare for corn uh, to 300 euros and uh, it is very difficult from year to year to manage this compensation and to, to uh, so you can see this uh, usage is still intensive and even more intensified from period to period, uh, which makes it not much easy to get large areas. And well, we had, uh, Various uh, ecosystem services. I also have to mention the carbon sequestration and fixation, which is in wetlands generally high, the nutrient retention and self purification. We had also on the Danube Basin, Sandos, Rhine accidents, with a cyanide spill from an Australian mine in Romania. So it was a hot cyanide spill, and uh, the Tisa was died. Uh, over 600 kilometers, so even in the same magnitudes in Rhine River, floodplains were very important because all Makotsobentos fish species escaped to the floodplain waters and uh, the resilience of the system, the recovery of the system was coming out of the floodplains. So while we have a lot of uh, natural resources and recreation, final slide from my side make it again a bit more detailed or technically for the prioritization. So you would need, of course, for further, for shorter reaches, we would need more hydraulic modeling, discharges, water level, flow velocity, sediment. We would need more hydromorphological data and monitoring. Um, in, regarding, in particular regarding lateral connectivity, it makes not sense to reconnect floodplains which are uh, yeah, totally ground out of the flooding system. Which, which is very expensive to maintain, also restoration projects to maintain, to make restoration projects self-sustaining. It's very hard and you need a strong monitoring. Yeah? And uh, as already mentioned, social in indicators. And well, um, it is of course needed to have detailed habitat and species survey for potential sites. Yeah? This is also obvious because that's also the latest uh, um, Article 17 report in Austria that um, habitats and species related to wetlands are still in a decreasing uh, um, um, yeah, abundance and quality um, than we can expect. So it is still a decrease, even if we found so much floodplain objects uh, that we have already still so much floodplains in all, some, uh, a lot of floodplains in Austria, but the quality of habitats they provide, um, there is a slow uh, decrease, um, which is uh, a significant issue in my opinion. Okay, I think um, Loris will further. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, challenging. Okay. So uh, th these were the prioritization, some uh, ideas about the criteria. Then going uh, further with our backbone scheme about the money. Um, we need to set the basis, the financial uh, basis for larger scale restorations, first on national level. What I mentioned, without uh, having a proper financial mechanism which support land use change, we will fail in most of the cases or in a lot of cases. <clears throat> Integrated projects should be financed as one package. What does it mean? If we are talking about large-scale restoration, this has a lot of type of components. Agriculture lands, forest, different kind of uh, water management related um, investments or measures, a lot of things. And uh, the existing financial background means that you have to split your restoration side and go for the rural development donor to finance something with the farmers, 
to train them, to have them, to change. You have to go for an other donor to finance another element of your project on the same site. <laughs> so the, it would be important to uh, have a project in one package to be able to finance. We need to ensure the co-finance, so it, it should be um, ensured by the government or another, for example, corporate for a longer term. And of course, we need a legal background. Additionally to the national level, additionally on local level, <clears throat> of course, there should be the proper uh, land ownership situation, we should be clear what is there. We should have, for example, an updated cataster about it. And we can set up local businesses which maintain the restoration. For example, if during the restoration, a rice farm owner will get water supply, then he is interested in the restoration and he will finance the maintenance after the restoration investment. Or reed can use as biomass. If the local farmer or landowner user can do this small scale business, then we can negotiate with them to finance the reed management after the restoration. WWF has some type of projects. I won't uh, detail because I don't have time, but I just would like to show you that um, on the left side, there are different type of steps or elements of restorations, pre-feasibility study, feasibility study, field work, communication, farmers training, etc. And on the, I don't know, for me it's a rest, okay. The other side is the, uh, the donors, the, the avoidable funds, which can be a rural development program, Norwegian fund, EU life, communication, nature, integrated life. It can be uh, under the Danube strategy. This is a new, the Danube transnational program. So there are avoidable funds. We just need to be aware. <clears throat> uh, stakeholder involvement. Um, I won't talk too much about this because I don't have time, uh, but we need to involve them in time and on a different level. This will help us to be able to prioritize which sites could be the first. If there are some good sites from technical point of view, then when there is a local will, let's start with those. We can save, of course, money if we involve them in time. And uh, we can uh, plan measures which are not useless but useful and uh, realistic. And if there is a local engagement of people, they will keep alive our restoration results. And what I would like to highlight, to find win-win situations from social and economic point of view, if this is possible. So for example, flood is a very good example. If we would like to restore a site, to be honest, only very few people are interested in the frogs and birds, but much more, if we can reduce the flood peak with that floodplain restoration, then we will have more chance to do the restoration. And yeah, this is just one method. Uh, this is just a message that, which is often a mistake. We don't have to involve everybody on the same level. We have to define their different type of methods of stakeholder analysis, which are those groups which will be here, where they are affected by the project very much, so critical or extreme, and the, it's, the, the project will be important for them as well. So those stakeholders which are here, they have to be involved deeply into this decision making, everything. But for example, there will be groups who are here, they can be only maybe informed or consulted. So this should be done, of course, during the process, in time, and it can be changed during a, even a process. Just, the, I think, the last slide, some of our main experiences concerning implementation. 
one of the main message, uh, restoration is not only water management business. We really need agriculture, rural development sector, forestry, fishery, everybody on board. Otherwise, we cannot do larger scale restoration. If we can prepare and we spend enough time to prepare a restoration, which is several years, then it's a half success. I talked the proper legal and financial background. <clears throat> what is very important that in the project, within the project partners in the consortium to have the same understanding on what we want with that project, what are the objectives, activities, what are the deliverables, and agree on the roles and responsibilities in time. And of course, we need to monitor the success. So find win-win situations from ecological, socioeconomic point of view, involve stakeholders, be more strategic, not only do scarce ad hoc restorations, but produce on national level action plans, for example, connect it with spatial planning, set the basis from legal and financial point of view, and choose one two areas first, try it, adjust the necessary national level conditions, and then implement it. And the last word, what I would like to say, and I always express this, restoration costs a huge amount of money. So from cost-benefit point of view, which is the best, is to avoid future deterioration, because which really hurts me a lot, that we spend a lot of time on restoration, which is necessary and very important. And meantime, with new future infrastructure projects, we lose 10 times more areas, floodplains and rivers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very, hello. Thank you very much for the invitation to the session today. Um, I'm working as a river campaigner in the Innsbruck office of WWF and I'd like to present you some uh, some insights maybe or a glimpse on the work we're doing on the river in. Well, uh, first some facts about the river in. Probably most of most of them are well known in this in this context. The Inn is a, an alpine river with glacial influence. Uh, the, mean, uh, the mean annual discharge at its mouth at Passau is about 740 cubical meters. This is more than the Danube. I'd, I was thinking about it's maybe a little bit heretic to say it here in Vienna, but in, in the reality the Danube is a tributary to the Inn. Uh, <laughs> looking at, at this point, uh, the total length of the river from its source in Switzerland to its mouth at Passau is 517 kilometers. 200 kilometers of this is, uh, belongs to the section in the federal province of the Tyrol. Total catchment area, uh, 26,000 square kilometers. It's about... Um, 7% belong of this, of this catchment area, 7% belong to Switzerland, 30 to Austria, and the rest, 63% uh, to Germany. Well, uh, f what's the situation we encounter at the inn? It's uh, a river which uh, is in a bad ecolog ecological condition. Uh, due to modifications of the course, riverbank reinforcements, and uh, also hydropower use. It is classified in the National River Basin Management Plan as a heavily modified water body, the, the whole river without exemption. Okay. Well, maybe just uh, one, one thing more to this, what you can, hydro, uh, hydropower influence is we in the, in the Tyrol, we have, to say it like this, we have only three hydropower plants in the section of the Tyrol, um, but we have a very strong influence of hydro peaking. What you can see here on the, on the right corner of the picture is an inlet from the uh, Selrhein-Silz 
power station. It's, as you can see, this is maybe the, the problem of hydro peaking is obvious here. We have sometimes, it's dry, and on when, when the, the hydro peak is in process, we have uh, an alteration of the surface level of about one meter in one hour. So that maybe gives an, a little bit of an um, idea what, what's the problem uh, with hydropower here. Okay, just also in this context, uh, the same picture or the same, the same area. This is my, my home village, just besides of it. That's why I've, I've gathered some old postcards. That's about uh, the situation in 1900. And well, as all over the river and probably in all Europe, you can see how the, how the situation changed over the years. Well, talking of hydropower, um, 23 hydropower plants are along the, the whole course of the Inn River. Um, it's inter that's the, the pointer here. Okay. Interesting just to see um, the, the main amount is from the, from the uh, Austrian-German border until, until the mouth. There we have the biggest amount of hydropower plants. <coughs> we have uh, this section which is uh, still free-flowing. It's about 155 kilometers. It's situated in the Tyrol directly. Um, and in Switzerland, we also have a series of hydropower. There is, um, they are mainly not dams, but they are... Please help storage. me. Storage. Storage. Ausleitung. Storage. Sto they are yeah. st storage power plants. The red ones... Um, are hydropower plants scheduled? Hydro the black ones are already working, and the red ones are scheduled hydropower plants. Okay, um, another problem we encounter on the inn it's of the originally 32 fish species abundant, uh, only two are still in considerably numbers found today, brown trout grayling, just an, an information on the site with the implementation of the first hydropower in Bavaria on the Inn, that was in about 1928. The commercial fishery that existed on the Inn broke, went completely broke, so that just gives an, also an, an insight a little bit in, into the problematic, then what else uh, we have, as we already uh, heard today, it's the same situation all over and also on the Inn. We have a substantial loss of original floodplain forests. Uh, this, this is a survey which was made in, in the middle of the 19th century, more or less. Uh, the, there was a, more or less the, the, the number given back by this survey was about uh, 1,600 hectare of floodplain forest at, at that time. Today, we have, we are in the province of Tyrol now I'm, I'm speaking about, we have only about 5% left of that. Most of these remaining areas are under protection by now. They are about, say, a little less than 90 hectares we encountered it today, uh, remains of the re remnants of this, of this floodplain forests. Mostly, of, most of them is already under protection. Not all of it, but most of it. Okay, why why does the river in matter to the WWF? Well, it's uh, an important biological corridor between Alpine and the Central Eastern European region. As I said before, it's the so-called Austrian champion in terms of free-flowing river. There is no other river in Austria which has such a section without barriers undisturbed. It's between uh, more or less the city of Kufstein and to the west uh, Imst, more or less. And it also is situated in the scope of two major WWF programs, the European Alpine program and the Carpathian program. So we are sort of in the core of WW interest in Central Europe. Well, what are our goals on the River Inn? F 
first of all, as we know, it's or as I mentioned before, it's not from the from the um, conservation point of view. There is not so much really high value areas in terms of of, of extension are left, but this 150 or more than 150 kilometers of free flow are something very special and th that's the thing uh, WWF is, is caring about and, and that's what we want to maintain, obviously. Um, it's also about managing the existing protected areas along the rivers and convert the, the remaining river in forests into protected areas by law. That's also something we are after. Uh, we are uh, working on securing characteristic species and habitats um, and there is also a, a big issue is combining uh, flood water protection measures with ecologic measures. Um, what are we doing to contribute to these goals? Well, uh, we are, say, supporting active resistance together with local environmental initiatives against new dams within these free flow sections. This is a, maybe an important part because we always, in the, in the discussion which is very current in, in, this, in these weeks, I would say, it is always stated that WWF is opposed to anything which is in connection with hydropower. We are not. We are, uh, we are always stating that there are some no-goes, as, as was mentioned already today, and one of these no-goes is these free-flowing sections. Uh, two hydro uh, plants were scheduled in the last years. We could say successfully managed to, not only us, but we, we contributed a lot to it that in the, in the public opinion that shifted a little bit. And we are at a point in the latest, uh, in the latest government proposal of the federal <coughs> province it is, all, it, it, it is proposed that it will turn into um, a law that this free-flowing section will be uh, preserved without dams. So that's just an, a glimpse. Uh, what else are we doing? Uh, management of the protected areas is very important. There we are cooperating with the regional government by providing a, a person which works within the WWF. This person takes care of the of these protected areas. For one, one of the most conflictive is uh, are two small areas close by Innsbruck. I can say it's not really a job to envy. Uh, it has to do with uh, getting people, uh, avoiding people to to uh, enter the, the the area in certain periods of the year. It has to do with dealing with, with people who are celebrating parties there to telling them to get out to... So you can more or less imagine, besides informa informative work, working with schools, working with, with kids, it has also some aspects which are quite conflictive. It is a, a very it's a small, restricted areas and the pressure is very high, as you can imagine. If you, see, if you look at the, at the size, 16 hectares, very close to the city. So you can imagine what amount of pressure is on these areas. What else? Um, working in public relations, raising awareness. And that we are, we are doing mostly with nature events at the river, where we're trying to show people uh, what's, what's still uh, left there, what, what animals are living there, what's, what's special with the floodplain areas. We also have uh, initiatives restocking fish population with native fish species. That's also something WWF does. And there we are getting to the um, to a main focus. This is restoration work in terms of, of areas. And as you can, Im as you know, probably uh, all river area in Austria is owned by the Republic. Also, this, this area, these floodplain areas, which were mentioned already today, they are, I suppose, as also in, in, in the other countries, they are owned by the Republic. WWF doesn't own, uh, can't by law uh, own sections which are within this, this, uh, this area. So, this is where we uh, are looking for cooperation 
with the owner, and this the owner is in this case Republic. So uh, there was a, a concept was launched together with the government of the federal province about seven years ago under the title Unser In, means our, our in, uh, translated. What were the main aims? It's easily to see more space for, for extending the, the river. Uh, also, connectivity, lateral connectivity was an issue of the tributaries and um, uh, creating new space for, for riverine forests. This is maybe also one of a, like I would call it a little bit of a, a hybrid position we are in because on one hand uh, we have to oppose uh, problems, uh, projects which we consider as, as as bad for the river, say hydropower plants in these in sections, they are considered as, as um, valuable. On the other hand, we are working together, trying to work together, and we, we do it also uh, with the government in, in creating new areas. So this is, now it's getting maybe a bit um, confusing. In 2008, a new cooperation with the government of the federal province of the Tyrol, the Ministry of Environment and the WWF was launched under the title DER, so DER, IN. I put also in the logo. Um, it was basically was the same aims, but uh, this is the, the current project, so I, I put in also that we're talking about the, about the current things. What were the main targets? Providing current information on flood water risks. Also doing studies, but they were mostly carried out by the, by the uh, federal partner. Flood water protection measures, developing a river following a natural model. We call it a light build. I hope this is the, the right term also in English. Connection of the tributaries with the main river, linkage of river and forest structures, communication and public relation, awareness and acceptance of new flood water retention areas and restoration. This is a very important part because it's encountered more and more that uh, the traditional way of trying to, to reduce uh, flood risks by building dams is not working anymore. We saw that uh, 2005 with the last big uh, flood on the Inn where the city of Innsbruck was just very close on the edge of a uh, say, a catastrophic inundation, and after that it really started with this idea and it was publicly also more accepted of, uh, that we have to have flood water retention areas. Okay, uh, this is an overview of, of uh, measures that uh, took place on the ground. The one I highlighted with red is the one I'm just uh, showing you in continuity, this is called Restoration Measure Safaus Chupach after the, the villages which are close. The problem, an area of 13 hectares, former floodplain forest, uh, wasn't subjected to river dynamics anymore. The river bed has deepened substantially, uh, ground water levels lowered. Uh, as a result, the remaining forest had had no connection anymore to, to flood dynamics. This was the, the scheduled plan. Was carried out uh, the last three years. Uh, how, how was it done? The fossil river and forest, mainly spruce forest, was removed. The surface level was lowered to the, to the current level of the river where a uh, periodic inundation can take place. Um, initiating gravel banks, still water areas, leaving also uh, sections of, of vegetation which, which is, was more uh, close to the natural model of, of a floodplain forest. And also the, the measure was carried out by a gravel extracting company which could keep uh, the valuable material that was encountered there. That's not always the, the uh, the case, but in this case it was. It was valuable gravel. So the, the company who did all the works was quite happy with it because they, they could, it was, as we call it, a, a good win-win situation. They could uh, keep the, uh, the gravel. Okay, then we have the, 
next uh, small, there are also uh, small meshes. Uh, the problem was due to the decades of retaining sediments, in for, uh, especially in the hydro, in the Swiss hydroelectrics. The riverbed of the Inn has lowered substantially in this part, in the upper part of the Inn. We're talking about uh, one, two meters. So the tributaries, uh, they are encountered in a very high step over the, over the current level of the riverbed. Um, solution removal of the barrier. Also, I have to say that this, this um, measure on its own wouldn't really uh, help. It is also, it was understood in, in, the, in the Swiss authorities that they had to change their water management in their hydropower plants. Nowadays they are um, sending uh, floods. Uh, they, they don't keep the, the in, in case of flood, they don't keep waters back, but they letting it flow free with all the sediments and that has uh, led to a, to a sort of stabilization of the, of the problem in the last years. There's another, another restoration work more uh, close to Innsbruck. What was the problem? Uh, rem a remnant of a river and forest uh, used partly as training grounds for off-road motorbikes. Uh, poor, degraded, sparsely vegetated habitat, but with a very high potential because it, was, it, it encounters in a, in a river bend with low current velocity. What was done? Uh, it was built of a, a side arm was built, um, and also still water areas. Uh, they are very working very well there. The still waters effectively adopted by amphibians. Only to give a more or less a measure, this this the amount was 285,000 euro the, of the execution of this of this measure. Financing entities, the federal province of the Tyrol and also the European Union. Some figures of the, the whole uh, program they are in. Uh, the whole amount was 3.9 million euro. Uh, this is more about the measures um, until 2012. Planning measures cost 200,000 euro. Uh, execution of the measures was about 1 million euro. Short, okay, I'm, I'm keeping it short, preview of future activities. Uh, uh, WWF is still contributing to new measures on, on the inn in the Tyrol. There are, there are uh, restoration measures uh, planned and we are financing the planning of it. International cooperation as the inn flows to three through three countries, Switzerland, Germany and uh, Austria. We are, we are uh, scheduling a project of looking at the whole river, therefore, and also to in identificate uh, the problems. The study was elaborated in 2013-14, just very small, uh, just very, very shortly. What are the problems in Switzerland? As I said, hydro peaking, residual discharge, and also linkage of tributaries with the main river. Uh, the problems in the Tyrol, I already uh, talked about it. It's the, the, the lack of, of areas in, in first place. And also hydro peaking, for sure. In Germany, they have uh, surely a, a problem with the continu continuity of the river, but this is uh, actually this, this is being resolved, this problem, at least. They are saying it. And uh, they are also, we are, it also is necessary improving uh, residual water discharge of existing hydropower plants. Uh, what's the strategic target with this cooperation with the two uh, WWFs? Uh, the, we would like to uh, res, um, install in river as an international model for restoration of a heavily modified water body and also for putting in action the water framework directory. Thank you for your attention. Just a few sentences before we start this 15 minutes long movie. This is uh, introducing a project which was uh, done. It, uh, it was closed uh, in the end of last year. 
<laughs> was support, supported from Life Nature. And uh, you probably know that WWF is working generally on policy level and field level parallel. Field projects uh, are used to underpin the policy messages, and uh, it's also very useful because we can put uh, partners around the same table and, uh, and show how these models can work in reality. In case of this specific project, it's very interesting that we could uh, put uh, together three sectors. One is the governmental sector, the second is NGO sector, and the third one is uh, corporations. The main, uh, main supporter from com cor corporation side is Coca-Cola, which provided the own source, most of the own source, which was needed for the life project. And there is also a company involved, which is partly state, uh, it, it's a state owned, but working on a market uh, level, which is a drinking water providing company. This project is also was interesting for us because uh, in spite it was initiated by a local mayor, in the end it became much a bigger story because it's not a purely nature conservation project and it's not a recreation conservation project, though the mayor thinks. Uh, in, in reality, it combines several issues which, makes, uh, which make it uh, complex because uh, this uh, natural filtration function of living river arms or branches uh, have combined impact with the natural values and also economic values. Mohástól néhány kilométerre a Dunán egy három kilométer hosszú sziget található, nagyjából akkora, mint Budapesten a Margit sziget. A Szabadság sziget értékét nem csak az ártéri erdők élővilága adja, a sziget mellett húzódó mellékág állatvilága is sok színű. Persze még sokkal változatosabb volt, ameddig egy 6 méter magas kőgáttal el nem zárták a víz útját. A kőgátat 30 évvel ezelőtt építették olyan célal, hogy a Duna vizének minél nagyobb mennyiségét a főágban tartsa azért, hogy nyáron kis vízkor is jobban lehessen hajózni. Ma már tudjuk, hogy nem ez az egyetlen szempont. Az élővilág megőrzésén túl az egyik legfontosabb környezeti szolgáltatás, amit egy folyó nyújtani tud az ember számára, az ivóvízzel kapcsolatos. Itt a Duna mentén sok helyen parti szűrési kutakban nyeri ki az ember az ivóvizet. Az élő folyóág abban tud segíteni, hogy a természetes szűrő szerepet hagyjuk érvényesülni, így sokkal tisztább a kinyert ivóvíz, és kevesebb vegyszerrel rövidebb tisztítási folyamaton keresztül tudjuk felhasználhatóvá tenni. Mi idősebb mohácsiak még emlékszünk arra, hogy milyen volt a 60-as, 70-es években, és még a 80-as évek elején is. Ez volt a mohácsiak viziparadicsoma valamikor, oda jártak horgászni, oda jártak az evezősök, főleg a fiatalabb gyerekekkel gyakorolni, nyugodtabb körülmények között tudták az edzéseket lefolytatni, és ragyogó strandok voltak ott a Dunaparton. Aztán a 80-as évek közepén, amikor megtörtént az elzárás, akkortól kezdve lehetett látni azt, hogy fokozatosan feltöltődik az átony köz, és egy, egy iszapos, rothadó területté válik. Látható a különbség az átony két oldalán, ugye a Duna felőli oldalon egy folyóvizet látunk még itt, a belső oldalon gyakorlatilag egy feltöltődött medret. A program célja az az, hogy egész évben biztosítsuk a vízfolyást, és ez az állapot, ez önfenntartóvá váljon. Sokáig nem lehetett késlekedni, hiszen ha a feltöltődés folytatódott volna, akkor fokozatosan megszűntek volna az értékes vizes élőhelyek, a hordalék hátán a fűszfák, teljesen átvették volna az uralmat. Amikor megjelenik már a fűz, ez egy olyan fázisa a szukcesziónak, ahol már semmiképp nem a nyílt víz és nem a folyóvíz a domináló. Ennek a folyamatnak a vége az lesz, hogy elzáródik a holtánk, feltöltődik teljesen iszappal, illetve homokkal, és a végén egy zárt erdőtársulás fog rajta kialakulni. A mellékák feltöltődésének és a sziget eltűnésének megakadályozása hatalmas feladat, amelyre a WWF vagy a Nemzeti Park önmagában nem lett volna képes. Volt rá remény, hogy az Európai Unió Life alapjából 75%-os támogatást sikerül elnyerni, de ehhez előbb a 25%-nyi önrészt kellett biztosítani. Nagy összegről volt szó, hiszen nem csak a munkálatok kerültek sokba, de a magántulajdonosoktól a szigetet is meg kellett vásárolni. 
egy olyan konstrukciót sikerült megvalósítanunk, amiben EU-s támogatás, vállalati, önkormányzati és magánszemélyek hozzájárulása egyesül ebben a projektben, és így tudtuk összevetni a teljes költségvetést. Az összefogásnak köszönhető, hogy 2012-ben több éves kemény előkészítő munka és alapos tervezés után örömteli mondatok hangzottak el. A projektel érkezett oda, hogy megkezdődnek a kivitelezési munkák. A kivitelezés során először a mellékágat fogjuk megkotorni, a két végéről indulva, és így fogjuk kialakítani azt a megtervezett medret, ami reményeink szerint hosszú távon biztosítja a vízáramlást a mellékágba. Két kotróhajóval hét hónapon keresztül napi 10 órában kotorják az iszapot, hogy ez a mellékág megtisztuljon, és az öt éves program végére egy gazdag élővilágnak adjon majd otthont. A kotróhajók ingáznak a mellékág és a Duna főága között. A hajó test a Duna közepén szétnyíli, így engedi ki magából az iszapot. A főágnak ez kimondottan jót tesz, kicsit mérsékli a medermélyülést. Itt látható mögöttem a mellékágnak az a szakasza, ahol még nem dolgozott a kotróhajó. A karók mutatják az útját, amerre haladnia kell, így az iszapkotrás befejeztével újra feléled ez a mellékág, ami egy nagyon gazdag, vizes élőhely, új mellékágat nem keletkeznek, ezért olyan nagyon fontos a meglévők megőrzése. A Szabadságszigeten és a mellékág szemközti partján Kora ősztől gyönyörködhetünk a lombszíneződésben. A zöld juharok levele is szép sárgák, de az amerikai kőrisek lombja még ennél is élénkebben virít. Ám a természetvédők egyáltalán nem örülnek ezeknek a fáknak. Ami miatt nem kedveljük, az itt látható a bal oldalon, és hogy rendkívül sok termés hoz, rendkívül sokat érlel, hihetetlen gyorsan, robbanásszerűen elszaporodik ilyen élőhelyeken. Az amerikai kőrisekhez hasonlóan agresszíven terjeszkednek a zöld juharok is. Ezért is nevezik őket özönnövényeknek, vagy idegen szóval invazív fajoknak. Reméljük, hogy a szabadság szigeten már nincs nagy jövőjük. -2011. februárjában felbőktek a motorfűrészek, hogy véget vessenek a zöld juharok és amerikai kőrisek uralmának. A szigetnek az északi részén 2x2,5 hektár területen tervezünk tarvágást, ugyanis az előzetes állapot felmérés alapján ez a két terület az, ahol túlnyomó részt invazív fafajokkal borított a terület. Őshonos fafajokkal, erdészeti technológiával fogunk erdőfelújítást végezni. A vágás területen láthatunk, olyan kisebb-nagyobb fákat, amelyek nem kerültek letermelésre. Ezek a hazánkban honos fafajoknak a egyedei, ezek szabadállásba kerülve, megerősödve, jó koronát fejlesztve képesek arra, hogy magot teremjenek, maguk körül elszórják, a természetre bízzuk ezeknek a maguknak a sorsát és az erdő fejlődését. Az átalakítástól azt várjuk, illetve az azt követő erdőfelújítástól, amelyeket ősonos fajokkal végzünk majd vénicillel, magaskőrissel, hazai nyárral, hogy a folyó völgyére jellemző természetes erdőköz hasonlító állapotot tudunk majd létrehozni. Az erdősítés sűrűsoros technológiával történt. Egy hektárra kis sor közben 12 ezer csemetét ültettek, így az ősonos fácskák lombja hamar összezárul. Árnyékukban az invazív fajok nem tudnak megélni. Másfél évvel később, 2012. júniusában többek között a Coca-Cola Magyarország elszánt munkatársai húztak kesztyűt és ragadtak szerszámokat, hogy folytassák az erdészek által megkezdett munkát. A vállalatunk önkéntes munkával is támogatta a Szabadságsziget megmentését. Egyik évben több munkatársunk is a Szabadságszigeten végzett olyan munkát, hogy különböző oda nem való cserjéket eltávolítottak. Ebben a munkában több mint 80 munkatársunk vett részt, és bevontuk a helyi közösségeket is, a helyi iskolák diákjai is segítettek ebben. Az erdők átalakításának célja az, 
hogy a Szabadság szigeten a vízpartok jellegzetes fái, a széterülő sűrű lombozatú fehér fűzek és kajla, aszimetrikus levelű vénic szilek nőjenek ott is, ahonnan az utóbbi évtizedekben kiszorították őket az idegelmonos fafajok. Ehhez nem elég egy öt éves program, de az őshonos erdők helyreállítása öles léptekkel elindul. 2012 őszén nagy volt a sürgésforgás a Szabadságsziget mellékágát elzáró kőgáton. A sajtóból országszerte egyre többen értesültek róla, hogy a mellékák felélesztésének feltétele a kőgát megnyitása. Ehhez viszont az ivóvízvezetékeket a meder alá kell sűjjeszteni. Két csővéget saját anyagában felmelegítünk, 225 fokos hőmérsékletre, és a hegesztőgéppel egymásnak végsejük a két csővéget, és ebből létrejön a kötés. A WWF munkatársai tudták, hogy milyen komoly műszaki feladatot kell megoldani ahhoz, hogy a meder élővilágát minél kevésbé háborítsák. Nem ők kezelték a gépeket, de magukénak érezték a feladatot. Az új vezetékszakaszt irányított fúrással helyezzük meder alá. Ez úgy kezdődik, hogy egy indító gödröt kell ásni, ahonnan elindul a fúrófej, és ívesen megy át a meder alatt, a legmélyebb pontján 14 méter mélységben. A csövet a túladarról fogják behúzni. Amikor ez az egész elkészült, akkor válik lehetségessé a kőgát megnyitása, és újra folyhat a víz a mellékákban. Már össze vannak hegetve a csődarabok 168 méter hosszúságban, ezt a csövet fogjuk majd behúzni, és ezzel váltjuk ki a régi ivóvízvezetéket. Megkezdődött a csőbe húzása, folyamatosan húzza a gép. Már az új ivóvízvezetékek üzemelnek a régi, használaton kívül helyezett vastag csőnek a darabjait már kiemelték. Itt látható az egyik vége, ezzel fognak arra tovább haladni, szállítható méretű darabokra vágják és elszállítják a területről. Ki fogjuk bontani, fel fogjuk darabolni, és ahonnan látni a csárga jelzőkarokat, onnan indul meg a kőgátnak a bontása. A régi csövek feldarabolása és eltávolítása után már csak egy feladat maradt, a gát megnyitása. Az nyilvánvaló volt, hogy még rengeteg követ kell megmozgatni, mire a mellékákban újra szabadon folyhat a víz. Először kisebb markolók a kőgát magasságából faragtak le két métert, aztán jött a nagy ágyú, egy több mint 50 éves, vontatóhajóval mozgatott torony markoló. Talán furcsa, hogy a markoló miért a vízbe dobja a földet és a köveket. A magyarázat az, hogy mikor áradások idején a víz átbukott a kőgáton, a gát alatt kimélyítette a medre. Ezt a hatalmas víz alatti gödröt tölti fel most a kőgát anyagával a markoló. ...2013. szeptemberében aztán elérkezett az ünnepi pillanat. 31 év után először fordult elő, hogy a Mohácsi torna egyletevezősei végigevezhettek a mellékágon. Ezután a fokozottan védett szabadságsziget háborítatlanságát nem csak a törvény biztosítja, de a mellékágban áramló víz is. Száraz lábbal nem lehet a szigetre átkelni. Az érdeklődőknek ahhoz is evezniük kell, hogy a vizitanösvény tábláit elolvashassák. A szövegből azt is megtudhatjuk, hogy van remény a természet újjáéledésére. Nagy testű, hosszú bóbítás szürkegémek eddig is vadáztak a mellékági vizében. Ám az élőhelyek javulásának köszönhetően a jövőben új fajok felbukkanása is várható. A halak közül újra itt szaporodhat a kecsege és a leánykoncér. A természetvédők reménykednek, hogy a háborítatlanná váló szabadságsziget kimagasló fáin hamarosan a fekete gúlyák is fészket raknak.
a jó irányú változások még épp hogy csak elkezdődtek, de már is elmondhatjuk, hogy a széles körű összefogással megvalósult szabadságsziget projekt sikerre van ítélve. élve.